An animal caught in a trap will gnaw off its own leg to escape. What will you do? What is most unbearable to young men about modernity is that feeling that I'm sure many of you are familiar with of being trapped in a zoo. And what's worse, a zoo, a cage, whose bars are invisible. This is the criticism which many philosophers, including Nietzsche, have leveled at modernity. In modernity, man is reduced to a zoo animal. When we see animals in zoos, we sense that there is something wrong. And why is this? Why, when we look at a tiger in a zoo, do we feel such pity? Do we feel the urge to free it? When we see the tiger pacing back and forth behind the glass. In theory, as people say, these animals are living long, healthy lives. They are cared for. They are living more comfortable lives than they would in the wild. They are living longer than they would in the wild. Yet when we see the tiger pacing back and forth behind the glass, we feel that it would be more humane to let it out into the wild, even if, after a year, it were to die. And I don't think this is just us projecting our feelings onto the animals. When you see animals in a zoo, they have a certain lethargy to them. They look bored, and I don't think that's just projection. These animals, when taken out of their natural environment, have no way to express their instincts. The tiger cannot go out and hunt all of its food is given to it. The apes do not need to fight other tribes for territory. All of the pressures, all of the struggles and challenges of life are removed. But that also means that all of the adventure of life is removed. It might sound nice that the tiger just has this big juicy hunk of meat tossed down right in front of it, and it never has to go hungry. But what is a tiger's life without hunting? What is a tiger without hunting? This might seem like a hard pivot, but I am reminded of Aristotle's four forms of causation, one of which is telos. That's where we get the word teleology. And this form of causation might seem surprising initially, because telos denotes the end or reason for which something was made. And we don't usually think of that as a form of causation, but it kind of makes sense. For example, an axe was made to chop wood, therefore it is likely to be used to chop wood because of the axe's form, right? So when someone sees an axe, they're likely to use it to chop wood, whereas a spoon is not likely to be used to chop wood because of its form, because of what it was made for. But we can apply the same thinking to biological beings, to animals. Animals have a certain structure to their body, to their biology, to their instincts. And this structure serves certain purposes. What causes animals and people to reproduce? It is fundamentally our instincts, the very structure which we are born with and this structure has a purpose to it. When we see a beautiful woman, our instincts drive us towards her, right? For what? Well, for the purpose of reproducing. So we see that there is purpose built into biology, or at least we can think about it that way. And when we see animals in captivity, we sense that their purpose is not being fulfilled. And we get the same feeling when we see, for example, let's say an unhealthy, obese man in a small apartment in front of the glow of his computer screen with crumpled up snack bags all around him. We sense instinctually that animals in zoos suffer in two ways. One, because again, everything is given to them because they have no challenge. Their suffering comes from a lack of challenge and therefore from their boredom and lethargy, but then also from a related issue, which is the deprivation of space. One cannot express their instincts if they do not have enough space to do so. Obviously, if you are confined within a prison cell, right, there's only so much you can do. You can't learn to run really fast because you're in this small prison cell. Your ability to express your instincts is limited. And both in the case of biological life and human life, the struggle for 
space is absolutely fundamental for the organism's development. Why do we find the idea of imprisonment so repulsive, or the idea of a child who has been imprisoned, who has been locked up in their abusive parents' household, let's say? It's because their growth was stunted. Their inborn ability and potential was never allowed to be expressed or manifested since they could not encounter the world and therefore encounter challenges which would require them to exert themselves, to grow and to uh, max out, so to speak, their inner potential. All these instincts, all these drives, all these potential abilities which they have within themselves were left to atrophy, to fester. And we sense that this is wrong. We sense that this is perhaps one of the most cruel things one can do to a living organism. And this is exactly what modern man suffers from. He finds himself in the exact same situation, or a similar situation at least, to a zoo animal. We can see that from childhood, kids are always in controlled spaces. Yes, they are allowed to play and play sports, but even these things now are highly monitored, especially compared to even how they were just a generation or two ago. You may have heard your parents say, oh, our parents used to turn us out into the neighborhood and just say, be back by this time. And very few kids get to do that today. Whenever you play, it is monitored it's in a controlled space, in a playground or in a school playing field. When you play sports, it's on a sports team and there's coaches or teachers or parents watching on from the sidelines, making sure you don't get too rough. I've heard from some kids that they weren't even allowed to touch the grass in their school playing fields. They had to stay on the concrete in a basketball court or something like that because the school was worried about them getting sued so they wouldn't let them leave the playground. They couldn't even touch the grass, they couldn't climb trees or anything like that. Luckily, I was able to do a lot of that stuff. And when children grow up with no outlets for their instincts, no freedom to experience struggle and challenge, of course they're going to grow up spiritually mutilated, dysfunctional in some deep way. And what's worse, these kids, a lot of the time, they are actually punished for expressing their instincts. If they get too rough while playing or they express anger or anything like that, they are taught that these instincts, even their sexual instinct, is bad. They are shamed for it. They are told to hide your anger, hide your instincts hide your sexuality, do not express it. These things are bad, they are aggressive, they are oppressive, they are harmful. And so these kids who are then taught these things, they already have a bad relationship to their instincts, they probably weren't allowed to develop fully, then they go out into the real world where they experience the same thing. Everywhere you go in the developed world, or most of the places that you go, are controlled spaces. You live in a small apartment in a city, you are constantly around other people, constantly being watched, constantly being monitored. And in this way, it is like you are living in a giant zoo. And I think this is the root of a lot of the disorders which people have in modernity and which our society as a whole has. I believe that what we are experiencing on a collective level in the Western world is in some way at least related to what was observed in the mouse utopia experiments conducted by John Calhoun in the late 50s and early 60s. He used the term behavioral sync to describe what he saw in these experiments. The mice were put in an enclosure, but this enclosure was filled with everything that they would need, food, water, etc., to simulate a natural environment. In this way, it was like a utopia, a little garden of Eden for the mice. And in short, what he observed was that as the population exploded and space became scarce, the mice began to experience this thing, behavioral sync, which looks an awful lot like what we call in human history decadence. The mice started exhibiting atypical behavior, some of them refusing to eat, some of them killing their own children some of the females behaving like males and the males behaving like females. Violence, aggression, they seem to devolve into this kind of caste system where some of the mice wouldn't work at all. 
and the others, uh, they would uh, abuse the other mice in the kind of lower part of the caste system. If you want to hear more detail about this, the YouTube channel What If Alt Hist did a very good in-depth video about it. But the essential takeaway is that life, when deprived of space, becomes dysfunctional. When the instincts cannot be expressed, which requires space, then they start to misfire. The instincts are turned inwards, they become pathological. And this could be a partial explanation for what exactly is going on in modernity, what the fundamental quote-unquote problem of modernity is. The archetypal journey of the hero is to go out into the wilderness, into the frontier, and to there face challenges which draw out his heroism. Right? The hero is born with this inner nature, this inner virtue, or this fusis, but this virtue or fusis can only be expressed through challenge, through battle, through conquest, through conquering a monster, or raiding a foreign village. And this is also the archetypal journey of young men. This seems to be what young men require to develop properly. They have to leave the comfort of the home, the boundaries of civilization, and venture out into the unknown, into the wilderness, in some way, to develop properly. And we used to have rituals which served this purpose. We used to have initiation rituals for young men. From the supposed reconstructed Indo-European Koryos warband to uh, documented versions of this in various ancient European pagan cultures, young men would be cast out into the wilderness or they would join some kind of brotherhood or military organization or something like the Boy Scouts. And you don't have to go out naked in a wolf skin and raid villages. Again, something like the Boy Scouts could fulfill this purpose. They were given various wilderness survival tests. They would go out into the woods. They would have to overcome certain challenges. Now, what we're seeing in modernity is that as young men seek out these outlets for their instincts, certain institutions are developing. For example, the gym is now a well-established institution, and for many young men, it is kind of an initiation ritual now to go to the gym. And you go to the gym with your friends, you work out in there, you challenge yourself, right? You channel your aggression, you challenge your body, and therefore you manifest the inborn potential of your body, right? You lift heavier and heavier weights, you face harder and harder challenges, and as a result, your body grows, your body becomes beautiful and strong, and manifests its potential. Another one is jujitsu. That's another outlet for young men's aggression, where they can exert that aggression, they can train that aggression, and yes, it is still a controlled environment, but, you know, a much better one than the school playing field. It's somewhere where you can actually go, it's a place to express your aggression, to actually learn to fight, to struggle with someone physically, which is extremely refreshing for a young man. I think it's a necessity for a young man to have something like this in his life, a place where he can truly test his aggression and physicality. And speaking of the gym and jujitsu, this channel now has apparel. I know a lot of you have been asking for clothing that you can wear in the gym or while you do jujitsu or even just to mog people as you buy your beef and eggs and milk in Walmart. But we now have clothing. We put a lot of work into the designs using some of the art from this channel and the brand that I'm working with is very high quality. So if you want to check that out, the link is in the description and you can use the code HEROICIDEAL10 for a limited time discount. But back to what I was saying about the importance of ritual and ritualized institutions, we do have some of these institutions and traditions developing in modernity, but unfortunately they are kind of without historical context, and a big part of traditional institutions is their historical and often religious context. On a certain level, the very purpose of traditions and of religions is to pass down information to an individual about how they should relate to their instincts and to structure a society's relation to their instincts. 
from initiation rituals, which teach youths how to behave as a man, right? How to channel their manly instincts, their aggression, virility, and so on, to the institution of marriage, which governs the gender relations, to something like the Dionysian rituals, which get at the very essence of how biological life is understood. All of these religious institutions have some relationship to the instincts. And this is a lot of what Nietzsche was talking about. In Genealogy of Morals, Nietzsche critiques the ascetic ideal, which he believes seeks to restrain, to smother, to cauterize the instincts, and thereby to tame and diminish man. Nietzsche instead believed that we should embrace the instincts, that we should channel them and direct them. And in so doing, he is taking up the position of the heroic ideal in contrast to the priestly ideal. The ascetic priest views the instincts as something which are fundamentally bad, which need to be suppressed and controlled. Sexuality is called lust, and the ideal ascetic priest should be celibate. He should refuse to allow his sexual instinct to be expressed. And if someone must express their sexuality, it should be only strictly for reproduction. No pleasure should be taken in it. It should only be used in a utilitarian fashion. And the instincts as a whole are seen as unruly, violent, as impure, as driving people to debased and wicked action. And so in the priestly ascetic ideal, you have a fundamentally negative relationship with the instincts. And I think in our society, we also have a fundamentally negative relationship with the instincts. In contrast to the ascetic priestly ideal is the heroic ideal. The hero affirms his instincts and channels them. The hero, whether Greek, Roman, or Norse, views this explosive energy within himself as divine, as a gift from the gods. It is what makes him courageous, fearless in the face of danger. It's what drives him to bold and daring actions, to heroic deeds. And this is where the idea of vitalism comes in, in contrast to asceticism and hedonism. Asceticism advocates for the restriction and smothering of the instincts. It has a negative relationship with them. Hedonism advocates for their unrestrained and purposeless discharge. But in the vitalist view, the instincts should be harnessed, they should be affirmed and even intensified. One should not become celibate and choose not to reproduce, nor should one expel one's sexual energy willy-nilly. Instead, one should harness it in order to imbue oneself with the maximal vitality. And it is the same for all of the other instincts and drives. Thus, the vitalist view of the instincts goes hand in hand with the heroic ideal, just as the ascetic view of the instincts goes hand in hand with the priestly ideal. And I think for the modern man, changing one's relationship with the instincts, one's perspective on the instincts, is almost as important as finding outlets, concrete outlets for them. So one should absolutely go to the gym, learn a fighting sport, and this will help you change your relationship with the instincts. But there also has to be a mental, a spiritual shift as well. You have probably been taught from a very young age that your instincts are bad, your instincts are evil, right? Violence is bad, aggression is bad, the sexual drive are bad, right? Violence leads to murder, to crime and slaughter. The sexual instinct leads to assaults and various atrocities. You've probably grown up with the view that the instincts are these dangerous, almost demonic forces which must be controlled. And you probably have this view whether you grew up in a conservative Christian household or a liberal household. Because the liberal view of the instincts is very negative, especially after the 20th century. Right? We have this idea that at any moment we could be possessed by these violent forces leading to authoritarian regimes and world wars. But to heal your relationship with your instincts, you have to throw out all of these narratives. You have to start viewing your instinct as fundamentally good. And again, looking at their purpose, at their telos. The sexual instinct drives you to reproduce, to find beautiful mates, to have 
beautiful children. This is a good thing, a beautiful thing. It fills you with vitality, with virility. It makes you feel more alive. These are all fundamentally good things. And of course, if it's unrestrained, that is not a good thing. But it is also not a good thing if it is suppressed. That mutilates you spiritually. That makes you dysfunctional. And it is the same thing with aggression. Aggression is not bad. Aggression is not evil. Aggression in a man, which is also linked to the sexual instinct, is a good thing. It makes a man assertive. It makes a man more assured. He has less anxiety. He's more firm in his decisions. Aggression is what allows you to go after your goals, to defend your family. Of course, again, when unrestrained, that is not a good thing. But neither is it a good thing to have none of it and to become a neurotic pushover. The root of so many of our issues in modernity is our improper relationship with our instincts and the lack of institutions to deal with these relationships. And perhaps the worst part is that we don't even know it. We are zoo animals. We have put ourselves in a zoo and we don't even realize it. But we have the keys. We could change all of this very easily. And it starts with you on an individual level healing your relationship with your instincts. That explosive, wild spark of life within you, that is the gift of the gods. That is the will and the voice of God guiding you towards what is good. That flame of life within you is divine. To purchase our new apparel or join the ARCS community, check the links in the description.